In this series, lowimpact.org talks with people working to build a mutually owned, democratic, decentralised economy that builds community and doesn't destroy nature. We want to increase collaboration to bring about system change. Find links to the sites mentioned in the videos in the description below. Join the conversation by liking, commenting and subscribing to our channel. So at lowimpact.org, we're interested in helping to bring production back to communities. And so we're talking with craftspeople, smallholders, natural builders, renewables installers, and small business owners in our range of topics. I'll be asking them about their jobs and for advice for people who might be interested in doing similar things. And today I'm talking with Eloise, who is a weaver. Hello, Eloise. Hi, Dave. Could you give us your full name and the name of your business and your website? Uh, my full name is Eloise Sentito. Um, and if you Google that, you'll find my website, um, which is www.theseisles.co. www.theseisles.co. No extension on the end there. Um, and I'm a hand weaver. I liked your website because you're, you're producing useful things rather than just ornamental things. They're very beautiful, but they're, they're for using, not just for looking at. Thank you, Dave. Yeah, I, um, I'm drawn to that. I, I, I have artistic tendencies and I'm actually at a slight crossroads in my business now in that I'm realising I probably have to scale it up a tiny bit and start to treat it more as a cottage industry. Whereas up until now, I, I, I've, I've, I'm constantly distracted by sort of artistic tendencies so that every single piece is different and I enjoy improvising and creating. But it is all still anchored in, uh, in, 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 in clothing, in things that are useful. I, I, yeah. I, make, I don't want to make. I mean, people have very kindly said, you know, you're, you're an artist and you should be making wall hangings and charging four figures for them. And, mm. you know, maybe that would be a more lucrative business model, but it wouldn't have more integrity to my mind. I really yeah. like the integrity of useful artifacts. Um, I, would, I would quote William Morris, have nothing in your home that you do not believe to be both beautiful and useful. Yeah. So I want to talk about all the things that people need to know if they're thinking of potentially making a living from weaving. Um, first of all, just a bit about you. What, what, were you. what were you doing before this and what made you want to do this and how did you learn how to do it? Um, so uh, I was doing one vaguely related thing and one completely unrelated thing. The unrelated thing was teaching crit critical thinking and academic writing in higher education. So it was a straight, sensible, grown-up job um, that was brilliant, um, like really meaningful and and, and lovely in, in the core work. But there was an awful lot of admin and um, politics around it as well that was much more difficult with higher education facing cuts and increasing student fees and blah, blah, blah. It was quite a difficult um, culture to work in especially for me because i'm a bit of a feral creature so commuting into the city was um really hard um then the slightly related work was i was um running an upcycling dressmaking business so i'd make sort of party dresses wedding dresses festival dresses selling them at festivals markets um uh, and barely breaking even. So that was quite inefficient. Um, and I kind of knew that, and I knew that it would be hard to get it going and make it viable. Um, and I started to, but I started to want to leave the institutional job in the city. Um, I was living on a rented small holding and I basically thought to myself, well, what can I do that would complement smallholding, the ultimate smallholding lifestyle that I'd really like to achieve if I ever can, um, living off the land. Uh, I'd just sort of ditched the, clo the previous clothing business, uh, briefly gone full time at, at the university, um, drove myself and my colleagues completely mad and quickly reduced my hours again there. Um, but yes, so I was thinking of a new business and my mother was a shoemaker when I was a child. So I knew the craft world and having been in the dressmaking, upcycling sort of craft business, I, 
I had learned how not to do it. Um, and then suddenly the internet exploded, social media exploded, and I knew there were different possibilities. So I knew that I could develop a lovely low tech, wholesome small holding business with the help of, you know, high tech, digitech as my selling platform so that I wasn't trying to sell very expensive goods in very modest local markets. Uh, actual markets like in the town hall whatever which which doesn't really work for very expensive goods and handmade goods are very expensive to produce if you need to earn the a basic living wage um, which I do and did um, so um, and part of my question also was not only what what business would complement small holding what can I do what you know what sector do I know well that's the craft sector uh, what can I teach myself? What skills am I confident in acquiring fairly quickly? So I taught myself weaving. You taught yourself? I taught myself weaving. So weaving, I sort of thought, well, that kind of complements small holding and I'll have to have sheep one day, even though, though there are plenty of sheep in the world. But also there's um, there's an awful lot of unwanted fleece, of course, knocking knocking about because farmers can't get mm, the price yeah. for it, cover the cost of shearing. You know that. So the raw material was around and I was in you know, uh, upland farming country, Lot, plenty of sheep where I lived. So it's sort of um, sensible choice from that point of view. Um, taught myself a um, couple of YouTube videos, a very good pattern book, which is kind of the hand weaver's Bible. Oh, really? Okay. Okay. Yep. Can see it. I would recommend that one. It's an, it's a, it's a, oh, but just say a hand weaver's pattern book. By Marguerite Porter Davison. Yeah. It's um, it's really good, really helpful. Everything I need, and I think quite it's quite kind of sought after. Hundred years old or something. Um, oh, really? And so you got yourself up to speed just with so that book. I only even use a little bit of it. Um, it was more. I I'm practical. I'm good with my hands. I looked at the loom and I I worked it out basically. Oh. Living with so, another crafts person who was a cutler actually, um, but he helped me. He gave so the, me the, so the loom. Um, yeah, what sort of kit do you need and how much does it cost and where, where do you get it from? So I started with a very simple 22 inch table loom um, that I was given by my, my housemate at the time, um, who was uh, also a craftsman. He, he hadn't ever done any weaving, but he'd been interested in it. Uh, and sort of his his sort of engineering mind, it, weaving and cra craft is interesting because you're both artist and engineer at once. Maybe some would say neither one nor the other, <laughs> um, but you need you need both elements of that. Um, so the 22 inch table loom is is a very simple machine uh, machine. Uh, we're talking wood and wire and string and nothing else. Um, so it's ecological pretty ecological and you can pick those up very cheaply on ebay uh, you come you can come by them kind of in people's attics occasionally there's also somewhere called loom exchange although generally they'll do slightly bigger better looms on loom exchange what, what's so, a good starter loom because there are different kinds on there like i said i started on uh, that table loom table loom is a typical oh, table loom is a is a kind of loom yeah is a kind of loom. It's a um, yeah. That's a typical starter loom, or even simpler than that is the rigid heddle loom, um, which also will sit on the tabletop. But certainly the smaller ones, are, maybe they all. I think they all sit on the tabletop. I, I, I guess you could just make some things for yourself, couldn't you? To see if you're any good at it. Uh, what clothing or looms? Yeah. yeah no. Um, you, uh, once you've got yourself a basic loom, you could you could just have a go at making some things for yourself to see if you're any good. Exactly. Your, yourself, your friends, your family. Exactly. Um, you know, thick, chunky sheep's wool is quite forgiving, yeah. doesn't break too easily. Um, you know, there's a lot of frustration at first and you're not efficient. You can't, you know, you can't run a business from day one. Um, but you, you know, your efficiency builds. Yeah. So it has to be a hobby first. And then uh, perhaps yeah. I, I actually took it seriously right from the first moment. Right. I wasn't I, I didn't do it because I like it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I do like it, but it's, right. it, it was never a hobby. I did it right. because I wanted to grow the skills to, to, to launch a business. Right. Um, uh, it, another factor is that it's, an like many crafts, it's incredibly soothing. Like mm. mentally, it's not too stressful. There's technical challenge and there's artistic stimulus, but it's, I find it very peaceful. I mean, they use basket weaving in occupational therapy mm. yeah, for yeah. 
post-traumatic stress war veterans um, and I think this uh, fabric weaving can have sort of similar benefits so having been very very stressed um, with sort of one foot in, in in country life out in the sticks on Dartmoor and one foot in the city in quite a demanding I mean actually one of the least demanding teaching jobs that there is in higher education, but still a professional professional job with exacting standards and a, a pressured, you know, an institution employer that's squeezed by capitalism like we all are. Um, so lots of pressures and lots of stresses and I was getting more and more anxious and as campus was being more and more Wi-Fi'd and people were having smartphones more and more, my anxiety levels were going through the roof because I later found out I'm electrosensitive. So I just needed to retire, so to speak. I needed to retreat. I needed to get the hell out. I needed to run away um, and, and be in the countryside in my natural habitat. So weaving was a quiet, therapeutic task that I could grow into an, an employment. So what's your, what's your working day like now? What's the, what's the process? What's the manufacturing process? Well, I tell you what, I've spent an awful lot of time on the computer these last few weeks, and I'm um, unfortunately looking forward to an awful lot more time on the computer throughout the winter. Uh, so that's a lot of mental stimulus and um, not great for health. But the weaving part of the day is, yeah, is very soothing. It's great. Um, so I might make a batch of of, of um, shawls for example over a, the course of three weeks like it will may, maybe take about three weeks to make four shawls or something from absolute start to finish and that includes marketing photographing listing advertising as well um, three weeks when I'm when I'm working efficiently I can do that in three weeks so many of the days are uh, designing, sitting on my knees, looking at uh, the yarn combinations, making calculations in my head, then dressing the loom is a really long process. So a lot of my time spent with wool. What does that mean? Uh, the wool part of my business is dressing the loom, which, it, which involves make, winding the warp. So I buy wool on cones. Sorry, I haven't got those to hand I should have brought I buy wool on combs usually um, and I, I, I wind uh, wind the wool onto a warping frame which gives me it's a sort of frame with pegs on it and that gives me 32 feet I think of of warp and I might have um, I might have 300 warp threads so that's longitudinal threads side by side lined up wound on this warping frame and there's a cross at a certain point so I keep the threads separate you've got to manage the threads otherwise you get in a crazy tangle and then it's not soothing and therapeutic oh, right okay <laughs> maybe it is therapeutic but <laughs> I'm in a painful way so you've got to manage the threads and keep them orderly and organized the whole time so there's that and you take the you just sort of tie those together take them off the warping frame from the warping frame then you put them onto the loom so you're either threading from scratch or you've left your last project threaded through the heddles on the loom um, and you're tying to your new wool to your last project uh, which is a bit quicker than threading from scratch um, so basically dressing the loom is putting the wool onto the loom your warp threads onto the loom so that then you're ready for the actual weaving step, which is passing the weft on a shuttle back and forth through the crisscrossed warp threads mm -hmm. to make your cloth. That's, yeah. And what, what sort of things did you say you make? You make scarves, uh, blankets, what, what sort of things? Yeah, uh, blankets sometimes, but it, more clothing, um, scarves, snugs and other neck warmers. I've got a new line here, actually, which I haven't launched yet. So this is the very first peak um, at this kind of neckerchief. So it's a fairly, uh, a fairly fine weave, this one. Fine, fairly fine, warm, soft cloth for the neck. Um, and it's wool? It's wool. It's all wool. I only use wool. Um, I want to use compostable fabrics and um, there's so much wool produced in this country mm. that I sort of want to use up. It's, 
it's not vegan and there are arguably far too many sheep on the mm. highlands, especially in the uplands, causing flooding issues, overgrazing, blah, 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 and lack of reforestation. So it's it's contentious. Um, could you but, use other natural materials? Yes, you could. Um, there's not much to actually replace wool in terms of warmth and well, and most all natural materials are breathable, but uh, warmth and wicking factors and 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 comfort. Um, if if you're specifically making warm garments, so cotton and linen don't do the same thing. Cotton's great for a different kind of garment. Cotton's great for you know, or linen or hemp um, are great are great for uh, shirts, skirts, maybe jackets if it's heavy stuff. Um, You also have to think, though, that in most of those cases, you're planting a monocrop. So that's not very different in terms of our environmental impact and biodiversity loss from a monocrop of sheep, a monoculture of sheep. There are charts and tables that, that analyse the, the, the sustainability of the different fibres, actually, and some uh, there are it's sort of pros and cons. Well, I don't think wool is the greenest fibre. I think hemp is one of the best. But you've got to take into account factors, as I just said, like uh, pesticides and monocropping, um, also water use in the production of the, of the, of the yarn. Um, I've actually got uh, a poncho that I've just made here. Develop my own sustainability rating chart, which perhaps we'll talk about at some point. I'm not quite sure how to rate this one. So what I've got here is some Hebridean wool, so native Hebridean sheep spun in our own Scottish islands, um, undyed, which feels uh, pretty high up in the sustainability stakes in textiles for this country. Um, and I've mixed it with some Himalayan nettle. I say, so it's, I've got some nettle fiber, hand spun nettle fiber from wow. my local market, um, where the small hippie import business import from Nepal. And there's um, the green, the green uh, um, weft in this weaving is, spun by women on drop spindles using their teeth as they walk about their daily business um so incredibly so, slow and labor intensive so is that then, some sort of a fair trade do you, do you get that through 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 fair trade organization right fair tri trade because the business is is too small i think to, to as far as i know it's it's not certified but it most certainly is fairly traded in 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 it no, I'm just wondering about your materials and how do you do you have a relationship with spinners and uh, organisations that can get you the sort of fibres that you're looking for? Yes and no. Um, I, 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 I'm sort of, I, I buy on an opportunity basis. So um, we haven't actually mentioned my van yet and the way my uh, business moves around. But um, since 2015, I've been running my business out of the back of an old motorhome, uh, 1989 motorhome, and travelling about. So when I'm in the Hebrides, I can I can I can get Hebridean wool, which is fantastic. Um, and yet, I still use Hebridean wool even now I'm down in Devon, so it's being shipped a little bit further. I've not been to Nepal. Uh, it's not part of my business plan. I don't know quite how to give the sustain sustainability rating because although the fibre yeah. production is superb, these are wild nettles, um, you know, harvested by hand and entirely worked by hand mm -hmm. by by peasant women whose whose lifestyle is phenomenally sustainable compared to the kind of impact that we in the West have. Um, environmentally sustainable and yet it's been shipped from Nepal so this is the only time I've ever used this so I'm just talking you through the different fiber possibilities mm. nettle is a bit scratchy it'll get softer with wear it's like a scratchy kind of wool I suppose it's like a scratchy sheep's wool so it's it's almost as almost as good as as most of our native sheep breeds um, and it's a lovely color um, I don't know if I'll be continuing this particularly because generally my business ethos is about localism. So although mm, yeah. this is a very local type product, it's obviously not not local to me. Yeah. 
Although this isn't a bad country for growing nettles. This is not a bad country for growing nettles. And we know that people are harvesting nettles in the wild for textiles. There's a fantastic group called Nettles for Textiles set up by a friend of mine called Alan Brown. And that grew exponentially within um, sort of days of him making a video on how to make nettle textiles. I don't know. If I think we've got that video on the, on the low impact site. <laughs> Which have, yeah. Um, so what kind of marketing do you do? How do you uh, sell your stuff? So as I was saying, my previous craft business, like many craft businesses from the sort of 1970s onwards, would go to craft fairs and festivals, maybe markets, um, particularly craft fairs. But craft fairs, to my mind, um, range very much in quality and standards. So it doesn't help my for me sell my expensive um, products next to a hobbyist who might be making something, um, how to say it, not so useful and um, uh, not such high quality. So, so, so the lower end craft fairs aren't really any good for me and everything else there is cheap and my stuff just looks crazily expensive and, mm -hmm. and, and therefore doesn't sell. Um, the higher end craft fairs, uh, I actually haven't tried with this business. I tried with my previous business. The higher end craft fairs tend to be fairly, feel a bit exclusive and middle class to me. So I didn't hugely want to just be in this little middle class niche either. Um, so I didn't have an obvious immediate market. Enter Etsy and social media and a new era of, of 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 doing business and i resent it in all sorts of ways because in some ways it, of course it's corporate i use facebook um i'm dependent on some really good um really useful corporate tools mm. to reach the widest possible well, not the widest possible audience to reach my niche audience all over the world needs must Capitalism does not work for heritage craft. I don't think capitalism works for any local craft. So capitalism works when you want, when you can import your craft from India, from China, from a much poorer country that has a much cheaper labor force. That's the only way capitalism can work for craft. For local craft, it doesn't work because people cannot afford your time to make a shawl that costs three or four hundred quid or five hundred quid when they can buy one from India that costs a hundred or from a sweatshop in China that costs 20. Mm. So I have to reach quite unusual people who are really committed to our values, our ideals. And paradoxically, a third of my customers are in the US. So I have customers all around the world on all four continents. Um, and a third of them are in the US. I'm, I, I, I tend to rant and rail about the, yeah, the, um, the vagaries of capitalism and that requirement to always seek customers who are richer than yourself who can afford your craft. But I'm really proud to say that actually a lot of my customers, probably most of them because of how much I rant and rail, are very much like me so they're modest and humble in their in their lifestyles they're fairly frugal compared to the average middle class westerner anyway um and they uh, they would rather buy one shawl and have it last a lifetime than yeah. one That's every the thing isn't it yeah quality quality is uh and but the but the people who can afford that and to, and, and who are educated to make those choices are scattered about the world so the internet allows me to reach them etsy allows me to reach them there's a lot of lower quality things on etsy and there are some higher quality things including some very expensive actual art um and and then there's the sort of craft in between uh, which varies but there's some some really good stuff so that's actually been incredibly useful and I knew that as I was setting up, I knew that I had a, I could I could make a different business model from previous craft business models in order to reach 
green people like the low impact community um, who would value. Yeah, I want to I want to come back to price a bit later. Um, <laughs> But I wanted to talk more about the sort of practicalities of the job first. And uh, but so you can make a living from it. And um, it's still possible to make a living from craft produce in the UK. I don't know whether still is the word. And I'm not actually, if I'm being completely honest, sure whether how, 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 how apt the word possible is either. <laughs> what I can say is that if I owned a couple of acres outright myself, and had some kind of house on it and was growing a lot of my own vegetables and doing some barter, then the money that I currently earn would be enough. So, yes, you can make a living if your living is really modest. It's circumstances, yeah. <laughs> um, if, if you're trying to cover normal housing costs, no. But I say no within the context of my own business. So, Dave, I think one of the questions you, um, were, were, one of the points you raised um, in a previous discussion was about funding. Uh, and you talked about support. So, in terms of skills, you've got support from the Guild of Weavers, Spinners, and Dyers, for mm -hmm. example, if you wanted. What, what kind of support? haven't drawn upon that really uh regular meetings and uh teaching informal teaching um and and i think um some professional membership as well uh, and definitely a very high level of skills as regards funding support i haven't really looked into it because i make enough hoops of my own to jump through without trying to jump through other people's hoops as well i just have not wanted business funding yeah, i've not yeah. wanted that degree of business accountability targets blah 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 I, I created a business like this to get away from all of that so mm -hmm. integrity is crucial to me accountability um is something i i i um i really really value and we'll come back to that with the sustainability self-certification that i've that i've just developed um finally but um yeah, there might be funding available if you uh, if you want if you need to develop a proper business sooner. If you want to borrow money and invest in it, you can do it more um, financially viably than I have done it. And is, are there other ways that you could get some income from it? So sort of running courses or writing or online courses or something like that. All of that, think? all of that is possible. Absolutely, personally. Um, I want to focus, so I don't want to spread myself thin in the way that I used to be spread thin when I was teaching in a different discipline at the same time as running a craft business. Um, uh, so personally, I'd rather concentrate on my product and my marketing and selling, which um, in principle I don't like, although in practice I'm dealing with really lovely people, so in practice it's it's usually pretty positive. Um, but I, I I prefer to keep narrow because I have so many other interests and and if if you if you're wanting to build a small holding life then you're also growing food and chopping wood and blah 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 you're print you're print you're plenty scattered enough uh, without being scattered in your in your professional life as well. So.